Hail and welcome. This is Stephanie from Apex Languages and Gapanova School with your weekly dose of wordplay. What language am I speaking today? Norse, of course. Old Norse, that is, the language of the ancient Vikings. Why? Because I'm just that kind of gal. A little crazy, but not totally berserk. Oh yeah, also, because it's the inspiration for our list of new words today. Let's check them out, shall we? It's story time again. Oh, my favorite. Last time I talked to you about the Norman invasion of 1066, which totally transformed the language from Old English into Middle English. Well, before the French arrived, there were the Vikings, a face only a mother could love. They were pirates from Scandinavia who terrorized the defenseless population of Europe for hundreds of years. Legends paint them as wretched, cold-blooded monsters, but they weren't all bad. Leif Erikson was the first European to discover America, and, like him, most Vikings of his time were more interested in farming than fighting. Beginning in the late 9th century, hordes of Vikings began permanently relocating to nearby England, so many, in fact, that they took control of nearly half the island, calling their area the Danelaw. 150 years later, there would even be a couple of Danish kings on the British throne. But in the early days, things were hard, even after all the fighting stopped. Both sides, the Vikings and the Saxons, really wanted to trade with each other, but they didn't speak the same language. Sound familiar? So, what happened? Something rare, and in my opinion, wonderful. Students often wonder why English, surrounded by a sea of inflected European languages, barely has any endings, especially on our verbs. How do we survive? Well, it wasn't always that way. Old English was chocked full of verb endings, and noun endings, and of course, even more adjective endings, just like Greek, Latin, and modern day Russian. You can still see it today in very rare cases, like the personal pronouns, he, him, and his. Old Norse was a Germanic language, just like English, but North Germanic, whereas England had been settled first by West German tribes. So their tongues were similar, yet different enough when it came to those fickle endings. Take, for example, Old English Taima for time, as opposed to the Norse Taimi. Are they really going to let that one letter get in the way? Of course not. Just like that, the language began to simplify. The unstressed endings gradually grew weaker and weaker from lack of use until they were simply abandoned altogether, except for everybody's favorite S ending. This process naturally took hundreds and hundreds of years, but it all started with the Vikings. It should also go without saying that we borrowed shiploads of words from our Scandinavian neighbors at the same time, while some older words took on new meanings or forms. We have the Vikings to thank for such basic English essentials as they, their, though, birth, ill, die, get, give, want, take, until, weak, sail, skill, law, husband, queen, kid, both, seem, happy. If you wanted to say that they are happy instead, the Vikings are responsible for the irregular present plural form of to be as well. Interestingly, we even get the word gun from them, a shortened form of the female name Gunhildr, which meant war or battle. In North mythology, the number nine was especially significant. So today I'm going to introduce nine more Viking words that you may be less familiar with. The first one is berserk. Repeat that with me, berserk. Berserker originally referred to a special kind of warrior who charged into battle in a frenzied rage, completely wild, probably high on hallucinogenic mushrooms. 
This would give him superhuman strength, but also almost no self-control or awareness. He'd probably die, but not before bringing a whole lot of enemy warriors down along with him. The word berserker itself literally meant one clothed in bearskin to give you some indication of their raw power. Today, however, we've adapted this concept as an adjective, commonly heard with go, in expressions like he went totally berserk and started throwing things everywhere. In other words, it means crazy in an especially violent way. Next, we have slaughter. Slaughter. There's no laughter involved with slaughter, especially when the slaughter your daughter. This word was originally used to describe the butchering of animals for meat, as it still is today. But when applied to the killing of humans, it takes on an incredibly dark, gruesome connotation, often reserved for the mass execution of many people, men, women, and children, at the same time. Unfortunately, this is what the Vikings were famous for. They slaughtered the entire village, sparing none. Ransack, ransack is a little better. It means to search a place thoroughly for treasure, usually leaving a big mess behind you. The Vikings were also very good at this. After killing everyone, they ransacked the houses for loot. One other thing the Vikings were known for was their drinking. And when you drink too much, you tend to stagger home afterwards. You might also stagger around searching for help after being stabbed in the leg. What can I say? Viking parties were fun. Either way, to stagger, stagger, means to move in an unsteady way, like you might fall at any time. As you can see above, it was originally used to describe the act of trying to make someone else fall over. And it can still do that today, although less commonly. For that reason, it also carries the meaning to shock others, rendering them helpless with amazement so that you could easily tip them over if you wanted to. You can observe both definitions in this next sentence. I was staggered when, after five drinks, she staggered to her feet and demanded the keys. Along with our next word, blunder, blunder, Norse also gave us the related words mistake and wrong, both very common to language learners. To the Vikings, it meant to shut one's eye, which evolved into stumbling around blindly and awkwardly, another Norse word, in the dark. And from there, to make a dumb mistake, due either to carelessness or confusion. It doubles as a noun, describing such an error, as you can see in this next sentence. Without having studied, he blundered through the test, making lots of blunders. Both of these words do a good job describing an oaf. Oaf, who is a clumsy, stupid person. It's actually the Viking version of elf, also used to describe foolish or similarly defective children who they believed had been left by fairies kidnapping their real, smart and capable children. Oaf is, of course, meant to be an insult, much like calling someone an idiot. Let's practice being jerks together. Stop staggering around here, you blundering oaf. So, between all the murdering and stealing and drunken idiots, life under threat of Viking attack must have seemed pretty bleak bleak. At one point, that word must have had positive connotation because it started off as shining white. But that soon faded to pale blonde and gradually were still to washed out gray. It's now used to describe any scene or situation that is empty, exposed, or disheartening, like a dreary rainy day or my bleak proposals of winning the lottery and becoming a millionaire. Oh, I need a hug now. At least my problems aren't as bad as these guys. The bleak landscape filled them with bleak thoughts about their death. What's a Saxon supposed to do? You could just sigh and accept your fate, c'est la vie. Or you could start talking or gabbing 
with your neighbors to try to drum up some resistance. Gab, gab, is a much more lighthearted verb than bleak, originally meaning to brag, joke, or make fun of someone else. Nowadays, however, it simply describes light conversation between friends. The conversation itself can be referred to as a gab, although not particularly often. If you're a talented speaker, though, people might say that you have the gift of gab. That being said, gab can carry the negative connotation of someone who talks too much in an annoying way. This is especially true when used as an adjective, Gabby, also an unfortunate girl's name. The Gabby old ladies gabbed and gossiped away for hours. That was a good gab. Finally, we come to thwart. Thwart, which is what you're hoping to do to your enemies, assuming you could talk enough people into joining your army. To thwart means to defeat an opponent, or at least frustrate them enough that their plans against you fall apart and fail. To the Norse, it simply meant a cross, and that is also reflected in some special speciality definitions still in use today. But by and large, it's all about conflict across battle lines. The emphasis is really on trying to beat someone by ruining their plans before things get too bad not on seeking revenge after the fact. As you can see from the sample sentence though, it does not always have to be about physical confrontation. In the end, the politician was thwarted by his own ego. There are limitless ways to thwart an adversary, and sometimes, if you're lucky, they even defeat themselves. We are our own worst enemies, after all. Of course, I can't go without sharing your idiom of the week, up in arms. This prepositional phrase refers to a group of people who have had enough. They're furious with their situation, so much that they're ready to pick up their weapons and start fighting back. If you're the president of a country or the CEO of a company, this is the last thing you wanna hear. This principle isn't too happy either. Parents were up in arm about the school's new policy and demanded immediate action or else they'd start withdrawing their children. Arms is a good example of how the same word can have multiple roots and cause a lot of confusion as a result. This weapons definition traces back from Latin, via French of course, while the arm hanging off of your body's definition is Germanic in origin. Since it's so close in meaning, I also want to share one more idiom. Have an ax to grind, which means you have a serious complaint or other selfish motive you intend to deal with. In today's society, cutting someone's head off with an ax, grinded for extra sharpness, is generally frowned upon. But we can always go complain really, really loudly. And if that doesn't work, maybe we'll take them to court as well. Our final sample sentence reads, I'm here to see Doctor Who. I've got an ax to grind with him about a bill he sent me last week. And by the way, if you're wondering whether it's an ax or ax, they're both correct. Ax with an E is the most popular spelling right now, but it tends to change from decade to decade. Don't worry about it. It's not worth getting up in arms about. I wouldn't dare skip our practice activity. Otherwise, you'd have an ax to grind with me. So here it is. What is an important issue that you are up in arms about? Write an angry, but not too angry letter to thwart whoever you have an ax to grind with. The goal here is to keep the language civil without going totally berserk and making the other person think that you're a blundering oaf. Good luck. I'll see you again next week with a new set of words to gab about. Until then, no slaughtering anyone. Thanks for watching.